Hi, I'm Katie Hacker, and joining me today is Melissa Muir for a lesson on working with two common tools. I'm excited. These are my favorite tools. They were a very big game changer for me in my studio and work. So the first thing I want to talk about is a rolling mill. And when you have a rolling mill, there's a few different things that you want to do and look for on those. First thing, you definitely need to have it mounted because an unmounted rolling mill means one that's going to walk around, fall on your toes, and not give you a good impression. And there are different ways that you can mount one, right? Correct. So in my studio, I have it actually drilled into my bench top. And I want to have a nice sturdy bench top that's, again, heavy and not going to move around when I apply some pressure. Makes sense. Here in this studio, today we have it mounted to a board and clamped and this is something that I do quite often if I'm teaching so if I'm traveling around with it and that way it makes it a little bit more portable and I don't have to dedicate a spot for it but I use mine enough that it definitely needs a dedicated spot in my studio sure other things that you want to know is or else that you definitely want is a gear ratio now the higher the gear ratio the better it's going to be in this case, this mill has a four to one gear ratio. That means I'm gonna turn my handle four times to get one full revolution of my rollers. Oh, okay. And that makes it so that it's easier for you to get your metal through, it's a smoother roll, and you get better impressions that way. This mill is what we call a combo mill. So it has both wire grooves, a flat spot, and it may have another wire section as well. So in this case, I have half round and square wire profiles, which can be kind of fun if you're making rings or bracelets, things like that. It gives you some different options. Correct. So let me show you one quick way to use this really fast. Here I have some wire that is really thick. This is four millimeters, which is approximately six gauge here in the US. Very, very thick wire. And what I like to do is I like to take it, roll it down so that it's nice and flat, and then it can easily become a bracelet or some other component in my pieces. Well, and I have to say that bracelet is beautiful. Thank you. So what I did first was I rolled it down, and then I rolled it back through with a pattern. Oh, okay. and to get that pattern onto it. So the first thing I want to do is put this into the mill. And at this point, it's loose and open. And you're open. using the flat area. Mm -hmm. I am gonna use the flat area for this. Now I'm going to twist this until I get a little bit of resistance. I don't need a whole lot. And then I'm gonna back it out. So at this point, I haven't begun to alter my- So you were just measuring it. Correct. So now the gap is four millimeters. Oh. And now I want it to be tighter than four millimeters. So I'm gonna give this a turn. And how much you turn your mill or your gears up here just determ is determined by your mill itself. Everybody's is going to be a little different. But now that I've closed this down a little bit, now I'm ready to roll this through. And I should feel a little bit of tension here in order to get that. Now as I pull this through here, we're going to now notice I have a flat spot on my, my wire. It's not very flat yet, but it's begun. So now I'm going to turn it again, and we're going to repeat that process. And each time, again, I should feel some tension here. If I don't, then it's not tight it's enough. It's not doing anything. Correct. So this is a great way to make your own custom wire, your own custom sheet. Yes. And make your jewelry completely your own. Yes, and a lot of times what I'll do, even in my studio, is I'll take all my scrap silver, and I will melt it down, pour it into an ingot, and then I can roll out my own sheet to whatever thickness I need. Very clever. Yeah, so that's one thing that you can do. Now another common use that we have for the rolling mill is to texture. So here we have a couple of different patterns that I've already rolled through, and that's what I'm going to show you now. Now in my studio, there's a couple of different things, well, there's so many things that you can use really to texture with. Two of my main ones, though, are these brass texture sheets, and I have a whole sample board right here full of different options that you have for these brass texture sheets. There's so many of them. And then I also use these laser engraved paper shapes. So I'm going to just take one that I have here, and I've already cut my sheet to the right size, so I happen to know that it's going to give me the right size. And it looks like right you annealed it as well. I have annealed this already, and that just means that I hit this with a torch, and you wanna bring it up to the right temperature, and there's a couple of different ways to tell the temperature change, but you wanna do that so that you've got that malleability to it, and it's going to form better to your pattern. 
Now, it's not enough to just have your texture sheet. You also need to have something that's going to kind of give it a cushion and help to push that pattern really into, oh. or your metal into your pattern. So there's a number of things that you can use for that. I use a 140 pound watercolor paper. I also can use paper towels. And there's also a thin foam. It's a little, it's a little bit like kind of what you have on an egg carton, but it's a little bit more dense. Thinner and it's thinner. Is the reason that you use different ones so that you have a different texture? You can, because it will definitely impart a texture onto your metal. Uh, but it just kind of, you have to play around with it and your mill to see which one gives you the best impression. I always suggest that you run a sample through. So if you've got a, a pattern plate here, you don't want to run that through if you've not ever tested it. So you want to find a little square or something like that. Do a test first to get your mill set, and then you can go from there. Okay. So what I'm going to do first, and I'm going to use this with the watercolor paper. I'm just going to take my metal and use that kind of as my guide. And I'm going to cut out a little sheet. So it doesn't have to be exact. It can be larger, but I don't want it to be smaller. Okay. okay I right. definitely want to have that coverage. You need that um, protection. Yeah. And here's another thing too. A lot of people get kind of concerned that maybe if they put this into their mill, it's gonna damage their rollers. This is copper. If copper damages your rollers, it's Something's time for wrong. a new room. <laughs> it's time for a new mill, for sure. So copper, silver, gold, all of that should be able to be run through your mill with no problem okay. and no protection on it. So first thing I need to do, so I'm gonna leave my little pusher right here. I've got my pattern and I have my metal. The first thing I want to do is set my gap to this. Okay, so I cannot pull this out. So just like you did with the wire, you're measuring. Exactly. And now if I pull this out of here and I look, there is no impression made yet. So my gap is now set to this, but I want an impression. So I'm going to just give a little bit of a turn. And that was maybe like, what, an eighth of a turn? on this particular mill, but it just depends. So now I'm going to add that sheet and I'm going to roll this through. Now this I should be able to feel. And I may need both hands and I like to use both hands. See, and there is a little bit of pressure there. I don't want to be hanging on my mill. If I'm hanging on the mill, it's too much, too tight, and, and you're gonna make your impression smeary looking. Well, what will happen is it will stretch your metal and it will ruin your pattern. Okay. So in this case, and it's hard to kind of see, but if I took like a brass brush or something onto this, then I would be able to burnish that a little bit and you'd really be able to see, we actually have a very thick or a deep pattern on that. My pattern, as long as there's still a tooth and I don't see any kind of wear, this is still good to go. I could use that again. Nice. So that's one way that you can do that. Now, one of the things that you want to be aware of when you do these metal patterns. You can kind of see the difference here. Both of these have actually been rolled through. And these are ones that you purchased this way. Mm -hmm. Yep. And they come in big long sheets. They come in like 12 inch sheets. So they're about two and a half inches wide by about 12 inches long. These have both been rolled through and I can tell that because we've got this curve here. And then this one, you can actually see the degradation on it. And you can also see that the smaller piece has been rolled through. If I take my metal and I cut it to the same size, I'm gonna be able to get more uses out of that oh. because it's going to roll through and degrade this at the same rate. And this is again, good until you lose that tooth to it. And then with the brass ones, the nice thing about these is once you get it to the point where it's not giving you a nice crisp pattern, then you start to cut this up and this becomes part of your jewelry too. Oh, nice, that's a good idea. So, now that you've seen how to create the pattern, let's talk a little about how really quickly to roll one with the brass. So what I'm going to do is very similar, and this time I'll actually show you a different way of patterning or padding it as well. So in this case, my metal is a little bit smaller. So like I showed you on that example, I might have a little bit that's not quite the same, and that's okay for this. But here's another thing too, is you can actually use some paper towels, and it's going to give us a similar effect. This one will definitely give us a little different texture as well. But what I'm going to do is I wanna have about six layers of my paper towel. Now I have two paper towels here folded over. So that means I'm going to fold this over three times. 
And then you're just gonna cut this section off. Is that just so that it is a special thickness? Not even a special thickness, it's just one that I found has worked well. Uh, I used to actually wrap the whole thing and I found that it, you didn't need to. And that was before I knew what I knew about rolling mills and I thought you had to protect your mill from even copper and oh. silver. So I find that this is much easier because then all I have to do is just pad that. So same process, I'm going to bring this to the mill, I'm going to open it up a bit, get my metal in here and close it down till I hit that tension spot, back it out. And again, because I want that pressure, I'm gonna give it a slight turn. And now I'm going to pat it with my paper towel. And the paper towel I like because it compresses. So, so you even don't really though- you have to account for it when you're measuring. Right. So there we go. Now see this one, this is too tight and I cannot get that pushed. And that's my cue to back that off a little bit and just give it a little less pressure. And then I do it again. And that time, now I'm using my body here, but I'm not hanging on it. And this one's still a little bit tight. I could have gone a little bit looser than this. And so now, again, we still have a great pattern there. And you see our pattern oh, here. Nice. And this one, if you've got a really good texture and finish on that, it's going to translate to this. So now that we've seen how to use the rolling mill to get our pattern, let me show you how to use the disc cutters to create the jewelry with it. Okay, I can't wait. Let's do that when we come back. All right. I'm back with Melissa Muir to assemble jewelry from the pattern metal we've made. So now we have our disc cutter and we've, we've already got our pattern and we are going to use that one that we just rolled through in the mill using that brass sheet. And so some of my favorite features about certain disc cutters is that you can open and close them. So this one has a knob that you can turn. I like the little lower profile and I'm just going to insert my metal and then I'll close it down. But before I close this down, one of the things that I need to do is I want to shim the other side. By shimming the other side, it makes sure that my alignment stays up and down. You should do this anytime you have metal, especially over 24 gauge. It probably prolongs the life of your tools as well. Very much so, yeah. And one of the things that I did was I just took some scrap pieces of metal, cut little one inch squares, and I stamped the number of what gauge they are and that way then I can easily shim this. I happen to know that this is 22 gauge, so I'm going to use my 22 gauge shim, put it directly across, and I'm gonna close this down, and that makes it so that it holds my metal into place. One of the things that you also want to look for in a good disc cutter is that they will have an angle to them. Now, a lot of times people will call me up and they're like, Melissa, I have like the leaning tower of Pisa on my, my cutter and I think I must have ruined it. And you no. say, no, that's what you want. It's exactly what you want. And what that allows your, your cutter to do is to shear through that metal and makes it easier. You don't have to have as much force. Now when you use these, you want to take very good care of your cutters. And a lot of really good ones are going to have a definite top and bottom. Okay, so this one, it's a little narrower up here and your cutting edge is down here. You also want to lubricate this cutting edge and you don't need much at all. You just wanna roll that edge into your lubricant and that's all it takes. If you find that you get a buildup, then just take a little bit of rubbing alcohol and wipe it down and it will dissolve that and then you can wipe it down and you're ready to do it again. Okay. So you want to have a nice tight fit here so I shouldn't have any wiggle room in my, my disc cutter. And this is gonna be the loud part. You wanna strike it and you wanna hit it hard. I happen to be using a two pound brass hammer. I also have a one pound brass hammer. The goal is to get it through on the first strike. It doesn't always happen, especially if you're using thicker metals. So here we go. Ta-da! Tick three, and you'll also notice that I'm on this urethane pad, and that's also going to help protect our metal. Now, another thing that I really like about this particular cutter is that it has a full punch clearance system, so my punch doesn't get stuck. Oh, that is nice. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the features you should look for as well. So now, we have our disc. 
and it's perfect. You shouldn't have any burrs that need to be cleaned up if you've got a good disc cutter. But even good disc cutters over time are going to start to leave that burr. And you can just take a file or a little bit of sandpaper and smooth that down. Okay. So now you've got this and you can start to make your other elements. Whether you are going to create another disc to maybe make a pair of earrings or something like that, or another fun thing that you can do is create a washer. Nice. Now to do the washers, so again, I'm going to open this up. I'm gonna switch out my metal here. What I wanna do when I do a washer is I wanna cut out the center hole first. So let's say I'm going to create an 11 16 inch uh, washer, or well, the inside hole. Again, I'm going to shim this on the other side, close this down, and I'm going to find the 11 16 inch punch. Now this one happens to be labeled. Again, I'm going to lubricate just that cutting edge. And I don't do that every time. I do it maybe every three to four. Okay. So you don't have to do it every time. Definitely with a new tool you would want to. Yes, absolutely. So again, we're going to hammer this through. That one was a little there easier. There you go. Okay, now that I've got my center hole, what I wanna do is I'm going to move it to my upper hole. And in this case, I'm gonna to go to seven eighths inch. And so what you're saying here is you're gonna cut out the outer part of the circle. Yes. And the washer will be left behind. Correct, correct. So now what I need though, before I tighten this down, I've gotta center this. Now before you had to come in here and try to align this on your own and very rarely did I actually ever get a really good centered washer. So now what I'm going to do, I'm coming up here to the 7 8 inch. I'm going to find the center positioning die and I'm going to insert that in there and it's going to pull this in. And just so that you can see that, like I'll completely off center that now and see how it pulls your metal oh, in. So you don't have to hammer it or anything at this point. It's not a center punch. Correct. It's just the center position of the space. Mm -hmm. okay. And now I'll close this down. I'm done with this, and I'm gonna find my 7 8 inch punch. Again, I'm just gonna lubricate that edge. And one more time, I'm going to hammer this through. And now, and I did him pretty thin, but there's my washer. Yeah, that turned out really nicely. Mm -hmm. Looks good. So that's one of the things that you can do. Now, another cutter that is kind of a fun shape they have oval cutters as well. And disc cutters come in many shapes, but it's hard to find the ones that open and close, especially in alternative shapes. But they're starting to come out more and more. You're starting to see some of them. So again, I like to have that opening and closing. Now, one of the things that I like to do is off-center, perhaps, uh, my my hole. And Don't so, get crazy now. I know, right? So what I'm going to do this time is I'm actually going to punch out two at a time. Now I'm using 24 gauge sheet here, so it's fairly thin, and that way when you've got them on your ears, they're pretty light if you've got earrings. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to position this again for my center hole. And I'm going to line this up in here because I've got 24 gauge, I'm just going to use a little thicker shim because I'm doing two of them at the same time. The shim is not enough. So I'm gonna go just a little bit thicker. So this is approximately 18 gauge. There we go, that's good. So again, I'm going to cut out my inside. This happens to be 20 by 12, so I'll find my 20 by 12 punch. And put that in there. This one's gonna take a little bit more effort to get it through. Because there are two sheets. Because there's two of them. That wasn't bad. That wasn't too bad. And now I have those that can be used as other components, but this is what I'm really after. So now I'm going to move this around to a larger one. And because I want these off center and I'm purposely going to, I'm going to eyeball this. And I want to keep those two sheets together. And you have your shim. And I have my shim still. And now I'm going to lock this down. And that moved on me just a little bit. There we go. And this is probably still not perfect. One more time. Pull that in there. And now we're ready to go again. That one took a little bit yeah. more because it was so much of a bigger, right. a bigger piece that we were working with. And that now, great. 
And so, and they're kind of off center. I like that. Mm -hmm. So now what I can do once I have these, and maybe I have the solid back as well, anything like that. Now what I can do for that is I can dap them and begin to give them a little bit more shape. So I'll put these in here and move sure. these out of our way just really quick. So here I like to use these wood dapping blocks. And I like these because they're a little bit more shallow than some of the other blocks that you can get, especially the metal ones. And I like that you can get different shapes. So I have teardrops, I have heart, I have oval, I have round. And what I'm going to do is just place this in here and I use these wood daps. And then I'm going to pull this in here and I'm going to work my way around. So this is not something that you're going to just punch down on one place and it's all done. It's different, yeah, a little more nuance. Yep. So you just need to come around just a little bit more. Nice. And you would continue that, but see now we have that lovely little curved shape. Definitely, and I feel like disc cutter and dapping go together. Yes. Because the shapes that you're making quite frequently, it's good to give them some dimension. Well, and it is, and you, you can take it into a different, uh, dapping set and you can take them even deeper. You can make that bowl a little bit deeper. You can keep them shallow. It just opens it up and it gives you that dimension which you may or may not have otherwise. And then now the thing, I took this one on the inside, but let's say that I want it to be on the outside. So what I would do is place it with the design face down and repeat. And now, I you have a curving stone backward. Yeah. And again, they're the same, but look at the difference. It's so different. It is, really. This one's so much shinier. It must have to do with the relief and the way the metal is exposed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the way that it catches that light and everything like that. Nice. So there's a lot of different options that you can do. Then, let's say now that you have all of your components, how do you put all of that together? Well, there's a number of different tools that you can also use to do any of that. But first thing I need to do, thank you, is I need to create a hole, okay? And the hole is going to allow me to insert a, a jump ring or an ear wire or something like that. So I have here a pair of hole punching pliers and what I'm going to do is just punch in through this metal and that's going to give me a hole that I can then use to create the earring or pendant or whatever the case might be. And so I'm going to be, in this case, create another one. And now I'm going to use my jump ring. I have a pair of flat nose and chain nose. And everybody has a little different way that they like to do this. It's true. But I like the flat nose chain nose for me. And I'm just going to thread in my jump ring to the hole. There we go. Put that in there. And insert my next one. Nice. Maybe. <laughs> it always goes well until you get on camera. And then I'll close this. And the only thing that's left now is to attach your ear wire. But now you have your earring. Nice. And then for the ear wire, you would just open it the same way. Like exactly. A jump ring. Exactly. Just Those open really it like great. the jump ring and. I You're love, ready to go. I love that you made it completely custom. You know, you could even make your own ear wires, you could make your own jump rings, you could tube set stones on here. I mean, there are a million ways you, you could can, go. Yeah, and you can layer different elements so that you've got the washers, you've got other circles, all sorts of things. Yeah, well, let's take a look at these necklaces right here because this is something you don't often see. Right, so instead of using the jump or the disc cutter to create the disc itself, you can use it to create negative space as you can see on those two pendants. Yeah, those are good ideas. And I love that flower too. Yes, and all that was was five different discs and I put four of them together and one on top, soldered them together and put on a stone. Oh, nice, that's brilliant. And then let's take a look at some of the earrings. I mean, these there are so many ideas here, we can't possibly right. talk about them all, but they're gorgeous. Thank you.